This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Hello. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Ghana land and pay tribute to the Ghana people, the traditional owners of the land that we meet on. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. I would like to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia as part of the University's 25th birthday celebrations as we present the brilliant, wonderful, dynamic Robin Archer AO. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a diverse program and free program of events and exhibitions throughout the year, which reflect our fundamental themes, strengthening our democracy, building our future, and valuing our diversity. The session tonight is being recorded and a video and a podcast will be available on the Hawke Centre website next week. So therefore, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent um, to avoid the interruptions, but please feel free to join the Twitter conversation using the links shown on the screen behind me. Robin will also be taking questions after her presentation. So we've had a fantastic response to this event tonight and I see many of my friends here from the arts industry who many of you, including myself, have worked um, with Robin at some stage over the many years. I would also like to acknowledge the Honourable Tammy Franks, MLC SA Greens, and Mr Nigel Ralph, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. So just a little introduction for Robin, otherwise we will be here for many hours and we need to hear her. Robin um, has concert performances throughout 2016 in Canberra, Adelaide, Melbourne and Oxford and is writing a new music theatre show which she will actually direct. Watch this space. She's currently strategic advisor, arts and culture on the Gold Coast, artistic director of the Light in Winter Federation Square in Melbourne, deputy chair of the Australia Council, Chair of NIDA's inaugural Master of Fine Arts Cultural Leadership and Member of the Council for Australia and Latin America Relations, COLA. Robin is also an ambassador for the Adelaide Crows. I was expecting a response. And the patron of Adelaide's Brink Productions and Restless Dance Theatre. Please join me in welcoming Robin Archer, AO. Thank you. Thank you, Jacinta. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us tonight. Distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up, I've written a lot, I'll go like the clappers. <laughs> and all I can say is bring on the showdown on Saturday. <laughs> I'll be there for sure. In January, I had the good fortune to make a 12-day, seven-city research trip to South and Central America. My last full day was based in Valparaiso, the big old port city which sits almost at the same latitude as the Gold Coast, where I'm currently contracted to advise on accelerated cultural development. And you may well still laugh, but believe me, it's still working and really working. From Valparaiso, we were taken an hour's drive away to visit the coastal home Isla Negra of the great Chilean poet, Nobel Prize winning Pablo Neruda. I'd visited his Santiago home two years ago, the home which the hunter had raided. They burned most of the books there just a few days before he died. 
Despite prostate cancer, Nerida had been in good health and not expected to die so soon. His body, eventually buried at Isla Negra, is currently exhumed for the second time as it is still suspected that he was poisoned. It's the same reason that Victor Hara was tortured to death in the stadium at that same time of the Junta's ascendancy, the same time they bombed La Moneda, the president's residence. All of that time of horror recorded graphically in the Museo de la Memoria in Santiago. The reason was that their words, their songs, were too powerful. The Isla Negra is that perfect home, built to house a poet, a poet's family, his wife, his collection of shells and ships, mastheads, everywhere painted wooden flowing locks and tits to the wind. <laughs> Strategically positioned writing desks reveal themselves in so many corners, all with the sound of the Pacific knocking against the rocky shore. The sheer pleasure and content you get from some outside force that breathes you is incredibly important to me. The sound of the sea which I get both on the Gold Coast, the sound of the Pacific roaring all day, and the Gulf waters here, the sun setting at Henley Beach, I get here, and he fashioned his bedroom with 180 degree windows so he and his wife could lie there and watch the setting sun. I fortunately have both of those things. And for me, it is something about the asthmatic condition, something about something that's happening to you outside of you driving the world along so you don't have the responsibility of doing it yourself. The idea of me, I travel so much and when I'm in a train or a plane and I'm speeding with enormous intent to somewhere, some purpose, some project, but I myself may be asleep or entirely at rest, this for me is sheer pleasure. That absolute bliss of somebody else doing the work of keeping you alive rather than you having to do it for yourself. The Isla Negra is the kind of place you never want to leave. You feel, I can stop here now, probably not forever, but some indefinite period and read and write and simply be. In this house, his books are still present, those he wrote and those he read. The moment has the same fascination of just 10 days before that visit, um, when I went for perhaps my fourth visit in the last 30 years to Frida Kahlo's house in Mexico City pausing to know the books in her library in the Casa Azul. Here at Isla Negra, I spy a copy of Canto General. Originally started in 1938, published in 1950, it is surely one of the main reasons that the Santiago house, La Chascona, named for his then secret lover, Maria Uriate, who became his third wife, the word Chascona meaning a wild mane of hair, that was the reason, that book, that great epic poem, was the reason why the house was raided and damaged during the military coup of 1973. And it turned my mind to the notion of the manifesto. I question you, salt of the highways. Show me the trowel. Allow me architecture to fret stone stamens with a little stick. Climb all the steps of air into the emptiness. Scrape the intestine until I touch mankind. Machu Picchu, did you lift stone above stone on a groundwork of rags? Coal upon coal, and at the bottom, tears. Fire crested gold, and in that gold, the bloat dispenser of this blood. The translation is by Nathaniel Tarn, but an excerpt can never do justice to this vast history Nerida paints of the Americas, from the prehistoric to his present and all the deep injustice he observes, implying what needs to be fixed. An epic sweep is also what I see as a manifesto. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water, this land was made for you and me. Like Nerida, mainly for Central and South America, Woody Guthrie also laid out a manifesto for the North. Today, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton 
lay out their manifesti for America. The former wants to build a wall, forgetting so easily, so readily, that all walls, as in Troy or in Berlin, or the ruins of the dry wall of the World War II Italian intern camp north of here, all walls built to keep people out or in will one day come down and there will be pain attached. I'll mention pain again later, an essential element of what scientist Brian Walker talks about in resilience theory. In this American moment, I think of Allen Ginsberg and his pain. He had been to the Adelaide Festival and got into trouble because he wanted Aboriginal artists to join him on the stage at the town hall. I invited him back to my 1998 festival, visited him in his Lower East Side apartment in New York, chatted, he gave me a book to keep and signed it. He wasn't in good health and he never made it to the festival, dying in April 1997. His words, too, are what remain. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient, heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats, floating across the tops of cities cities contemplating jazz, who sang out of their windows in despair, fell out of the subway window, jumped in the filthy passaic, leaped on Negroes, cried all over the street, danced on broken wine glasses barefoot, smashed phonograph records of nostalgic European 1930s German jazz, finished the whiskey and threw up groaning into the bloody toilet, moans in their ears and the blast of colossal steam whistles. Of course, Howl by Allen Ginsberg. And Brecht, too, of course. The late lamented fame of the giant city of New York. One, who is there still remembers the fame of the giant city of New York in the decade after the Great War? Two, what a melting pot was America in those days, celebrated by poets, God's own country, invoked just by the initials of its names, U S. A, like an unmistakable childhood friend whom everyone knows. Twelve, truly their whole system of communal life was beyond compare. What fame, what a century. Thirteen, admittedly that century lasted a bare eight years. Fourteen, for one day there ran through the world the rumour of strange collapses, of a famous continent, and its banknotes, hoarded only yesterday, were rejected in disgust like rotten, stinking fish. Fifteen, today, when the word has gone round that these people are bankrupt, we on the other continents, which are indeed bankrupt as well, see many things differently, and so we think more clearly. Twenty-three, what a bankruptcy. How great a fame has departed. What a discovery that their system of communal life displays the same miserable flaw as that of more modest people. And even me... This is a bit, and they're all just small extracts of very, very epic pieces. This is a song that I wrote around about 1981 or two. Have you heard lately from England? Have you heard how they're doing there? Do you know about the four million unemployed and the threat that's in the air? Did you know that it's getting harder just to get enough to eat? That the housing's bad, that the old and poor never really make ends meet? And oh, oh you lucky country, I hold a certain shame in you, share collective blame for you. You'd know you're too well off if you could see the misery that's there. And oh, you lucky country, you're gonna have to lose it all if you don't learn to care. 
There's a stink of fear in Europe like you've never smelt before. They know they're being set up as the next theater of war. And a station in our desert will track the missiles to their land. We're 14,000 miles away, but the blood's still on our hands. In Flagstaff, Arizona, we saw Reagan voted in, saw flabbergasted Democrats weep into their gin, and we asked the Middle West, what made you vote for that man? They said, restoration of global image since the hostages in Iran, and oh, you lucky country. And then, of course, there's this one. The uncertainty of earning one's daily bread seemed to me to be the darkest side of my new life. Of course, the skilled worker is not dismissed quite so frequently as the unskilled, but even he is not completely protected against such a fate. Here, the uncertainty of the daily income takes its most bitter revenge on the whole of economic life. The farmer's boy who comes to town, attracted by easier work, be it real or imaginary, by the shorter working hours, but most of all by the dazzling bright lights which the city sh sheds forth, is still accustomed to a certain security of income. Frequently, he brings a little money with him to the big city so that he need not despair the very first day if he has had no luck in finding work for a prolonged period of time. Time. But the situation is more difficult when shortly thereafter he has to give up the job that he found. It's especially hard in winter, if not almost impossible, to find a new home. The first few weeks may go well enough, he draws relief and he manages as best he can. But once he's spent his last cent, and in consequence of his long period of unemployment, the Treasury suspend its relief payments, then the distress becomes great. Now he loiters around hungrily. He pawns or sells the last of his belongings. His clothes get shabbier by day by day, and he sinks into surroundings which, apart from the material misery he experiences, also poison his spirit. If then he becomes homeless, and if this happens, as is often the case, in winter, then his misery becomes acute. Finally, he finds work of some kind, but the game repeats itself. He is hit the same way a second time, a third, perhaps more severely, so that by and by, he learns to endure the uncertainty of life with indifference. Finally, the repetition becomes a habit. Thus, the entire concept of life of a fellow who is otherwise industrious is demoralized, and he is gradually transformed into a tool for those who use him for their own ends. He's been out of work so many times through no fault of his own that one time more or less no longer matters. Matters. It may no longer be a question of fighting for economic rights, but the destruction of political, social or cultural values in general. I was able to observe this process with my own eyes in thousands of cases. The longer I observed the game, the more my aversion grew against the metropolis, which so greedily sucked the people in only to destroy them." Unquote. We must remember then that heartfelt manifesti do not arise only from the left, that last was written in 1925 and is from Mein Kampf by one Adolf Hitler. There are many attempted definitions of manifesto. The simplest is that a manifesto lays down the platforms and intentions of the issuer. My father, Cliff Licky, as he was known professionally, was a singer, MC, stand-up, comedian, compare, parties, anything. I'm not sure he ever laid down a manifesto, though he never owned his own home because he had fallen foul of gambling in his West End Adelaide youth, right exactly where we are now. And once out of debt, viewed any borrowing, including a mortgage, as debt, a condition to which he would never return. But as a wedding singer, he certainly had plans for the Catholics. Ave Maria. And for the proddies, you by my side, that's how I see us. In the 1960s, he tried to make the transition to television. My mother and I watched his appearance on Stairway to the Stars. Mum disapprovingly shook her head and said, nah. <laughs> I knew it didn't work for him, was sad for him that he didn't make it through, but I didn't experience the shame and embarrassment that my mother clearly did. 
But I did carry with me the notion that I would have someone, some few, who could at the right moment gently administer the hook and tell me kindly when it was time to get off, to call it a day, to stop performing. So I hope my friends remain trustworthy. I'm somewhat amazed that the hook has not yet appeared, and so I keep singing. And in this manifesto, I declare that my intention is to keep singing. Far between sundown's finish and midnight's broken toe, we ducked inside the doorway as thunder went crashing. As majestic bells of boats struck shadows in the sounds, seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing. Flashing for the warriors whose strength is not to fight. Flashing for the refugees on the unarmed road of flight. And for each and every underdog soldier in the night. And we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Tolling for the rebel, tolling for the ray, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsaked, tolling for the outcast, burning confidently at stake, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing, striking for the gentle, striking for the kind, striking for the guardians and protectors of the mind. And the poet and the painter far behind their rightful time. And we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Tolling for the aching whose wounds cannot be nursed, for the countless confused, accused, misused, strung out ones and worse, and for every hung up person in the whole wide universe. And we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Don't imagine then that I'll deliver as poetic a manifesto as these men did. Revolution versus subversion, incrementalization versus transformation. I was once branded in my Adelaide early youth as rebellious, chosen, then forbidden by the RSL to go to Vietnam with Big Pretzel and Johnny Mac to entertain the troops. When I see them today marching on Anzac Day, I feel very sad that I can't join them. Um, the reason was because there was photographic evidence of me standing on the same platforms at Moratoria with other dark, bright revolutionaries such as Don Dunstan. I wrote and recorded songs about women's business, Lord of mercy, even lesbian business. But even then, I saw artists making more difference as feeders rather than frontliners. Being able to articulate for the first time the uncomfortable things people were thinking but had no words to express and no platforms for that expression. We give heart to those at the coalface and Tim Minchin performed that role just a few weeks ago. In the 1950s, when it was still 90 degrees Fahrenheit at 5 p.m., the Olympic pool on North Terrace st on King William Road stayed open till 9 p.m. There was an agreement between Dad and myself that on these evenings he would take me to the pool. He'd be at work all day, perhaps have something to eat when he got home, and then we'd drive into town. Darkly lit, the water was light green at the shallow end and dangerously dark at the deep end. Dad would swim too. I could never go fast because of my asthma, but slow and steady did the trick, and diving into those dark depths once or twice from the three-metre board was a particular pleasure. 
now shivering within the wet bathers, we always called them, not togs or swimmers, bathers, there came a creepily needy hunger which only a pastian source would satisfy. <laughs> In this manifesto, I declare that my intention is to keep swimming. Singing and swimming were the two things my father knew would help my asthma. He encouraged me to do both, and here I am, still singing and still swimming. In this manifesto, I declare I will continue to remember and be grateful for all the things my father taught me. Not just swimming and singing, but golf in the parklands with his rusty old clubs, footy rules, chess, how to plant and grow radishes, how to forage in the hills for mushrooms and blackberries, and cockles at Outer Harbour, how to to play the ukulele, how to drive, how to check the oil and water, and how to change a tyre. He taught me all the things he would have taught a son. Just half a century ago, 90 degrees Fahrenheit at 5pm was an occasion. Now it's commonplace. If 100 degrees Fahrenheit was predicted for the following day in those days, there'd be headlines screaming from the advertiser, oh, century, mercury hits century tomorrow. If we're only to get up to 37 degrees centigrade these days, we're smiling. Only 37, oh, thank goodness. Don't tell me it hasn't changed. I've never lived with air conditioning. I've never employed a house cleaner either. And in this manifesto, I declare that I may have to give in to air con and a house cleaner one day, but there is no immediate intention. The irony is that when it hits 45 degrees centigrade, I'm so lucky to live at the beach and idle down the sand burning the soles of my feet to the clear aquamarine water, but I'm thwarted in attempting full body immersion, precisely because St Vincent's Gulf is healthier now. The blue swimmers come in to nip your toes, the gar, exquisite whiting and tommy ruffs are plentiful, but so too are the snapper who come for the crabs, and then the sharks who come for the snapper. On those crisp white heat days, you get your ass into the shallows and soon comes the little plane warning you not to go any deeper. Now we don't blink an eye at the old century. People will drag out Met figures to show that it's always been thus, but it's not the reality. We are the hottest capital in the hottest continent on earth and it's really heating up. I can already see how some Adelaideans as climate change exiles, but oh cinnamon, where you gonna run to, oh cinnamon, where you gonna run to, oh cinnamon, where you gonna run to all on that day. Most Adelaideans prefer to run to Sydney, not Melbourne. By 2050, Melbourne will be the biggest capital in Australia, and it just experienced its hottest March night on record. By 2050, infinitely more people will be living in cities as the world over. So many of the cracked, dry regions are already abandoned. Once upon a time, I feared heat, as if it were a living, breathing, monstrous foe, like Ron Howard's fire in Backdraft. Now somehow it's changed, I'm more resilient. I find the fear is frequently unfounded. I can stand the heat. I can move around and do things and make meetings fine when it's 40 and above. But I don't think that well when I'm hot. It's harder to concentrate. And given that I have nothing to offer but ideas, songs and ideas, these are my only currency, then I need to concentrate to deliver both. In this manifesto, I declare I intend to stay cool. <laughs> Speaking recently at WOM Adelaide, David Suzuki praised Adelaide for its environmental initiatives. He said we should sing them loud. I think he was not including the plan for a nuclear waste storage facility. It took me a long time to realise that I was born so soon after the end of World War II. I sang my first real gig in the hills at Uradla RSL, where my dad was emceeing and singing at one of the regular Sunday morning free concerts for returned soldiers. These guys were given a variety show, some food and drink and cigarettes and lollies to take home. They were shot to shit, these men, shaking and disturbed, forlorn and lost, utterly traumatised by war. Today it's called PTSD. I didn't realise at this time that this was just 15 years after the end of the war. 
maybe 16 or 17 years after the bombing of Darwin, my mother was in the WAF, had started in telegraphy, ended up in her comfort zone of tailoring uniforms for the men. I love Darwin, I've worked there. I'm glad mum wasn't there at the time or I wouldn't be here at this time. She knew fellow WAF telegraphists she'd trained with who were killed in that bombing. It was the same number of years since the one-man submarine entered Sydney Harbour. How ironic that a Japanese submarine will once more enter the harbour, proving its superiority in submarine building and possibly affecting the future jobs of South Australia. I lived through years of anti-nuclear activity. Born just a few years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were founded, were nuked, and I've been to both of those places. Ever since the apple in the garden with Eve, man was fallen with things that cause him to grieve. He fool with the woman, with the Roman hot blood, and he almost washed up in the forty-day flood. But not since the doom day in old Babylon did he fool with anything so diabolical as the cyclotron. So if you wish to avoid the most uncomfortable trip to paradise, you will be scientific and take my advice. Leave the atom alone. Leave the atom alone. Don't get smart, Alexi, with the galaxy. You've got to leave the atom alone. If you want Mississippi to stay where it is. If you want to see Wall Street and General Motors continue in biz. If you want Uncle Sam to keep holding on to what's yours and what's his. If you're fond of kith and kin in their skin and bone. Don't fool around with hydrogen. Leave the atom alone. Bad for the teeth, bad for the bone. Don't fool with it, leave it alone. Don't mess around, you dopes. Lay off the isotopes. Don't you fuss with the nucleus. Don't go too far with the nuclear. Don't get gay with the cosmic ray. You'll burn your fingers, lose your hair, and be big smog in the atmosphere. You're most exasperated when radioactivated and cannot be located on the telephone. Go back to rock and roll, to rum and Coca-Cola. Go back to Eve, but leave the atom alone. Bad for the teeth, bad for the bone. Don't fool with it, leave it alone. Bad for the teeth, bad for the bone. Don't fool with it, leave it alone. That song was written in 1958 by Arlen and Harburg for the musical Jamaica and was sung at the time by Lena Horne. Dr. Strangelove, the film, or How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love the Bomb, came out in 1954, and Fukushima was destroyed exactly five years ago last month. They're still suffering, badly. Now, I know that South Australia needs economic good news. It's clear to see what backing away from the biggest open cut mine in the world means for the state. Clear to see what the collapse of the automotive industry means here. Clear to see what it means, despite the little salve of a defence centre, what the loss of the submarine building project means. It's just a rumour that was spread around town. Somebody said that someone got filled in for saying that people get killed in the results of their shipbuilding. With all the will in the world, diving for dear life, when we could be diving for pearls. Are we really going to be the recipient of others' nuclear waste? I saw Don quest through the world to find the answers. He too considered nuclear power, but he didn't get the answers he needed. 
He agonised over it because he too knew that South Australia needed better economic news, and nuclear power would have been good news, except he could never be convinced, despite his best efforts, that there was any guarantee that the waste could be stored safely. How much does Fukushima need to prove? I'm not sure if stress does exacerbate one's propensity for cancer, but Don grew sick and died before his time. The fact is that such waste has to be stored in a place which is guaranteed to be stable for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and no one can give us that guarantee. But whatever the reality of the potential for South Australia, where I was born, a place I love, from my beloved beach on St Vincent's Gulf to the great Murray River on the banks of which my mother grew up, from the Terra Rossa of the Coonawarra to the roaring Southern Ocean and bird life of the Coorong, for that place to become, at some time in the future, the place which rendered vast tracts of Australia toxic for hundreds of thousands of years, whatever this potential for this horror or not, I don't want to see our name become a bad joke because that's already happening. Everything I've done in my life so far, and my peers, and all that indigenous knowledge that was there tens of thousands of years ago, and past and emerging generations have done through arts and culture to build the name of Adelaide and South Australia, might be rendered useless if we pursue this project. It was Don who educated me on the City of Churches tag. He said it was not about the Wowser reputation. On the contrary, Adelaide was the place where you could establish a church in the name of any religion. Not dominated by the Catholic and Protestant dichotomy, Adelaide saw a proliferation of faiths here and became, in the spirit of free speech and tolerance, a city of churches. It was a badge of honour, not an accusation of prudishness. Adelaide's freedom of thinking was expressed in the establishment of female suffrage, the first in the Southern Hemisphere, and has often led the way in political and judicial reform. All this may be overshadowed if South Australia leads the way in storing global nuclear waste, whether the reputation is deserved or not whether what is feared ever comes to pass or not. Sure, we wasted a lot of time worrying about the bomb, and it still hasn't been dropped again, though certain countries are threatening, and Japan is suffering again to the extent that some European countries have decided against nuclear power, let alone waste storage. Whether we become the worst polluters in global history at a time when all of us are long gone and don't have to face the consequences, our current hard-won reputation is something to value. It is a fragile something that is easily tainted, and that can also lead to dwindling economic health. This reputation is already so obviously at stake as the possibility is even being considered. It won't matter how loudly and how often the word we exhort the world to use the title nuclear waste facility, the word they are using and will continue to use is dump. Our reputation, so hard fought for by so many of us in all professions, is already damaged. In this manifesto, I declare I intend to remain at very least sceptical, further opposed to any proposal for the establishment of a nuclear waste facility in South Australia. In all this, there also appears to have been an obscene neglect of consultation with Aboriginal people. I can't quite believe that Indigenous Australians were not the very first people to be consulted about this. How recent is Maralinga? How easily was Maralinga forgotten when this report was being conducted? And regarding the voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I wonder how many of you were aware of this report on April the 12th, 2011. Quote, in a recent letter to UN Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon, Mirar Elder Yvonne Margarula lamented the fact that uranium from the existing Ranger uranium mine in Kakadu is likely present in the stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant. She expressed her people's sadness at the suffering of the Japanese people. Quoting Yvonne, for many thousands of years, we Aboriginal people of Kakadu have respected sacred sites where special and dangerous power resides. We call these places and this power Ojang. There is Ojang associated with both the Ranger Mine area and the site of the proposed Jabaluka Mine. We believe and have always believed that when this Ojang is disturbed, a great and dangerous power is unleashed upon the entire world. My father warned the Australian government about this in the 1970s, but no one in positions of power listened to him. We hope that people such as yourself will listen and act today. Clearly not. 
Some will see opposition to the proposed facility as detrimental to South Australian economic futures. But as Brian Walker of the CSIRO and Resilience Alliance is constantly trying to point out, if we are to do anything about the environment, it will take some pain. I know that South Australia is talking about survival rather than constant growth and greed, but the point Brian makes remains similar. The constant quest for growth is made irresponsibly. You may be wondering when art might enter this manifesto. Don't worry, here it comes. I have often used environmental resilience theory as a useful approach to the ecology of the arts. In this manifesto, I declare, I intend to continue to use resilience theory in connection with the arts. Feed only the beautiful crown of the forest and neglect the undergrowth and you are headed for inevitable chaos. The forest will eventually implode and if you have not nurtured the stuff at ground level, there will be a period of chaos followed by a very slow process of regeneration. Pay attention to the undergrowth, the wildfires, the replenishment of weeds and stuff close to the ground. Your forest will evolve without chaos and live much longer. Oh, sprinkle the garden, the greens taking heart again, watering the thirsty fruit trees. Give more than enough. Give more, give more, give more than enough. And do not forget the shrubbery, even though it bears no fruit and is worn out. Do not forget that between the bushes there are weeds that are thirsty too. Nor should you water only just the fresh grass, for the naked earth needs refreshment to refreshment to refreshment to words by Brecht and music by Hans Eisler when they were exiled in Los Angeles. I said I would return to the subject of pain as part of resilience theory. Growth, 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 they all cry, as they cried in Walter Merring's Stock Exchange song in 1929. Speculation, speculation. Just two weeks ago, the Federal Treasurer said that the best way forward was not necessarily to cut income tax, but to do those things which would stimulate growth. This is the main plank of every government everywhere. Growth, growth, growth. You are failing the people unless you stimulate and prove growth. But when does anyone ever consider the consequences of unbridled growth? It is often the source of collapse in business, in industry, in agriculture. Look at the glut of fruit that has happened in our state, in economies, and often the source of dire consequences in both military capability and in ego. Someone recently asked simply and perceptively, how can you go on demanding growth on a finite planet? It seems obvious to me that if we find another planet with adequate resources or at least conditions to cultivate adequate resources to sustain human life, then go for your life. Grow that possibility. We are now in a moment that is surely very similar to the time of Columbus. Most people considering him off his rocket, so to speak, to go sailing off the edge of the world. Few people imagine that space exploration, flying off the edge of the universe, very much on your rocket, will find us another place to live. But it is likely to happen. And when it does grow away, right now we are not infinite, except perhaps in one respect, our collective intelligence. Educate to the best of our ability, and fresh brains will find real solutions rather than truckloads of Band-Aids. Right now, how about cultivating, along that quest for new fields, a framework in which we can survive and prosper without the constant and unrealistic push for growth? Yes, it requires pain, because it demands we reduce consumption of almost everything we now gorge on. Creating a smaller environmental footprint demands reduction, not growth. The Prime Minister said just last week that our economies depend on the consumer, correct? Yet what we should be doing is creating innovative approaches that allow our economy to thrive even as we consume less. 
Brian Walker's call is that if you want to maintain any degree of resilience against the sudden unexpected disturbances that befall any system from time to time, you cannot simply keep growing the profitable bits. Shrinking your base of operations, growing skinnier and taller in order to keep increasing returns to stakeholders makes you ever more susceptible to toppling over and inviting chaos. None of us seem to prepare to cop the pain that takes, and pain would now appear to be the very opposite of what those we elect seem to think we need. Without a certain degree of pain, the generations that follow possibly face a very grim future unless we can fly them to the moon and let them play among the stars. Find out at last what spring is like on Jupiter or Mars. And let me continue into the celestial, into that bright firmament of the arts. Tomorrow night, I will be inducted into the South Australian music. No, no, don't look at the lady who's leaving because it's going to take a quite a long time to leave because she's got to go all the way. You could go across here, dear, if you want. I don't mind. Do you want to get out quicker? No, all right. Very. F Would you, do you want to go down here? It's perfectly okay. It's quicker that way. I know. I'm, I talk too much. I understand. I know you've got something else going on. Please don't faint or anything. Brave woman. Give her a hand. Fantastic. <laughs> So let me continue into the celestial, into that bright firmament of the arts. Tomorrow night, I will be inducted into the South Australian Music Hall of Fame. You didn't even know it existed, did you? <laughs> I'll be singing with our old band, the Mount Lofty Rangers, um, of whom both Glenn Shorrock and Bon Scott were members at one time. Uh, yes, I brought Bon to Presbyterian Girls College where I was teaching and we had a lot of fun. Um, and in fact, and also Headband, which proceeded from the Mount Lofty Rangers, they are also uh, being inducted. Um, in fact, I'm going to rehearsal uh, right after this address. Adelaide. No. Adelaide. Adelaide. Where the clean, fresh air tastes like sweetest wine. It's one of our songs. Adelaide, Adelaide, I'm coming back to find my peace of mind and a little bit of my homes across the Mount Lofty Ranges. My homes across the Mount Lofty Ranges. Rangers, and I never expect to see you anymore, and maybe even a touch of, I got the menstruation, the menstruation blues. Now that's art for you. <laughs> And by the way, I did subsequently write the, I got the, mm, 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 <laughs> but in the spirit of Ethel Merman, there's no people like show people. They smile when they are low. Yesterday they told you you would not go far. Last night you opened and there you are. And then on your dressing room they hung a star. Let's go on with the show. Many of you will be aware that I have frequently drawn a clear line between showbiz, entertainment on the one hand, and art on the other. It just so happens that I am a rare hybrid of both. And while it's rare, I'm certainly not the only one. The poet and playwright to whose work I have devoted so much of my professional life, Bertolt Brecht, was one such. And if I had chosen songs about art rather than showbiz, and there are less about art than you can imagine, it would be from the set entitled The Hollywood Elegies, again written by Brecht and Eisler when they were in exile in Hollywood. Had they remained in Germany after 1933, we would surely have heard no more of them. 
America kept them fed, but this pair hated Hollywood, unlike Kurt Weill, who went to the East Coast and did very well on Broadway. And by the way, shameless self-promotion. We celebrate Weill in the Adelaide Cabaret Festival in June, and I'll be doing more Brecht than his peers as well. But in the meantime, making a clear delineation between art and Hollywood and what, in their opinion, Hollywood did to artists, Brecht and Eisler, with the green pepper trees to shade them, the composers walk past like whores two by two with the writers. Bach plays concertos for the strumpet. Dante waggles his shriveled backside. Just as the Adelaide Festival, which I so enjoyed directing, suffers a $1 million cut, there have been recent calls for new investment in the arts. The call is for a new contemporary gallery or building, and the justification, apart from more space to exhibit the collection, there's not a gallery in Australia that's not screaming for this, the NGA, the NGV, Art Gallery in New South Wales, the Gold Coast, the justification is cultural tourism. Everyone wants to quote Mona, and yes, Mona in Tasmania is a great success, but it didn't come from nowhere. Just as I was conducting my second Adelaide Festival in 2000, the late Jim Bacon, then Premier of Tasmania, asked me to create a new international festival for the island state. Jim said he had $600,000 stored away. That was $100,000 less than the subsidy I had just applied to get Peter Greenaway and Louis Andreessen's writing to Vermeer to that 2000 festival, one show. How was I going to create an international festival on $600,000? There was no alternative but to think my way through it. I came up with a festival which would not be called the Tasmanian Festival, would not be in one succinct place as in Adelaide, and would invite only artists from other islands. The success of 10 Days on the Island meant that local artists had a new platform and that there was a general uplift in cultural confidence. I have no doubt that it was that atmosphere of increasing confidence that eventually spurred David Walsh to start thinking about realising his dream. The gallery has in turn spawned new festivals and that in turn has led to new initiatives for local artists. It's with great satisfaction that I feel my colleagues and I have been part of that evolution and now I look to Canberra and the wealth of feedback I'm getting from our nation's capital that the centenary of, the centenary of Canberra, which I walked on, worked on for five years up to and through 2013, has had real results. Cultural tourism is significantly on the rise there and not just for the national institutions but for the festivals and day-to-day -day cultural context closer to the ground. And right now I'm working on exactly the same kind of brief for the Gold Coast. In just two years, the cultural landscape has evolved miraculously. A clear cultural strategy, bleach festival reaching throughout the 90 kilometre stretch, commissioning new works by local artists starting to think about international, artists returning there to live, little bit like Dunstan's South Australia uh, when he was pumping so much into the arts and suddenly uh, it was not so expensive to find a house and there was a bit of opportunity and artists came back. That's really happening on the Gold Coast at the moment. Um, we have five entities on three-year funding, one of which has had recent interest from Beijing, a resident contemporary dance company, The Farm, run by Gavin Weber, who used to dance with Meryl Tankard uh, in Meryl Tankard's company here. Um, they're making work on the beach and in the water and touring Europe. A new theatre company called Shock Therapy just walked away with three Matilda Awards. These are the main awards in Queensland for best new work, best director, and they were in competition with the Queensland Theatre Company, La Boite, etc. And the dig has already started about $38 million worth for a new cultural precinct, which we hope will be more adventurous in its approach to arts experience than any in the country. It's all about the great outdoors, okay? This is the kind of cultural richness that should arise from the sixth largest city in Australia. The Gold Coast comes immediately after Adelaide. But it's been a very long time coming, and it's now happening very quickly. 
I was tasked with cultural acceleration and that has worked. No longer just beach, surf, theme parks, which will remain a tourist stronghold for that place, but the addition of culture. In this manifesto, I declare that I shall continue to take great pleasure in working for the refreshment and reimagination of particular cultural landscapes. Oh, sprinkle the garden indeed and don't forget those weeds. But Adelaide doesn't need quite the same approach. It already has great success in cultural tourism. With Mad March now behind us, we reflect on the bulging successes of Festival, Fringe and Wome Adelaide and all those other annual festivals to come. I'm all for the expansion of the possibilities for visual art, but I make a plea for equal opportunity. Let the state not starve its artists and smaller outfits for the big stuff. Make sure you remember to water the weeds too. New buildings? Yes, absolutely, bring them on. But an equal amount devoted to the artists and the stuff close to the ground. You see, we can't pick winners. We can see what art has endured from the past. The collection at the Art Gallery of South Australia attests to what has survived, what continues to please, what sports the enduring qualities of craft and imagination. Even if we're talking late 20th century, it's what's proving to be enduringly worth retaining and exhibiting. The same might be said for what we hear for the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra. We can hear the music that continues to please after centuries. At the library, we can find books that continue to be important to us. We can see in all these instances, but contemporary means the stuff that's being imagined created and made in the here and now, the stuff you've never heard of, the stuff that surprises, the stuff that really makes you think even if you don't like it. In this manifesto, I declare that I will continue to demand equal opportunity for the support of contemporary arts practice in all genres equal to that which is reserved for the preservation of the canon. You see, it does confound me that people have such trouble with the notion of equality. I find myself not believing in the forced redistribution of wealth. It hasn't ever really worked, and I doubt it ever will. We are greedy, self-interested buggers. But equality of opportunity, that really interests me. We are all different. We are not equal. It is clear that I can sing, but I cannot run. No matter how much I train, even if I had a passion for it, I was never born to run as fast as Cathy Freeman. And Leighton Hewitt, no matter how much we share a passion for the Adelaide Crows, he will never sing as well as I. <laughs> what matters is equality of opportunity. I was given the opportunity to run and to play tennis. I often went blue in the face and had to be taken to hospital. It became obvious at that time um, when the treatment for childhood asthma was not as sophisticated as it is now, asthma no longer being a barrier for kids to excel at sport, that my body, my lungs, were not going to serve me well in any aim I might have had to be an elite athlete. Fortunately, I had no such aspiration. At the same time, I was winning prizes for drawing and painting. At eight or 10, perhaps, I was the youngest ever exhibitor at the Adelaide Advertiser Open Air Art Exhibition, and I got to meet the governor of the day, Sir Robert George. But by the time I was streamed into top science in my first year of high school, I was not allowed to study art. There was no music tuition at Enfield High School. My parents had sent me to some piano lessons, but it was in a smelly old house with a grumpy old lady, and I took much more pleasure in translating the ukulele chords my dad had taught me to guitar and singing pop songs of the day. Non, rien de rien. Non, je ne regrette rien. I have no regrets of any kind about any path onto which my life has led me. Had I had a voice teacher, they would have made me ease the break between my chest and my head voice, and I never would have been able to yodel. Quelle horreur! <laughs> but because I came from a suburb where formal music lessons were not the norm and did not occur in the state school system I was part of, I simply did not have the same musical opportunities as others my age. When I sing along with recordings of the great contralto, the Canadian contralto, Marilyn Horn, I know my natural voice could have been trained to that exquisite ambition. I didn't get the opportunity. Can you imagine 
What we lose every day, every year, every generation, simply by not giving equal opportunity, equal educational opportunity in all spheres, the arts, the sciences, civics and the rest to every child in Australia. Don't tell me that a kid in a remote country town has the same educational opportunities as a kid in a wealthy suburb in a capital city. Don't tell me that an Indigenous Australian has the same opportunity to live as long as their white Australian counterparts. Don't tell me that a person who finds love in a person of the same sex has the same opportunity to have that love validated by church or state if that's what they want. Australia is often praised as being a secular society. That's not quite true. There are some laws, unfair laws, we are legally obliged to obey, which are maintained because of religious interests. Gender inequality marks some of them. Yet any degree of inequality demeans us. Soon we will have some rare opportunities to correct these things, to create the conditions for equality of opportunity. Not all will take advantage of the opportunities thus created. Not all will have had the privilege of good health and good education to be able to take advantages of these opportunities. But we are less than great, less than lucky, if we do not work to ensure that equality of opportunity. In this manifesto, I declare that I intend to defend the right of all people to equality of opportunity. And that applies to the arts. Just as we believe that it is every child's right at an early school age to be introduced to the fun of sport and its attributes for health, teamwork and the notion of fairness, sticking to rules and the idea of sportsmanship itself, so too every child has the right, as clearly stated in Article 27 of the UNESCO Declaration, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, to be introduced to art in all its forms both as a source of pleasure and creative expression, but in the unique aspect of developing vital critical acuity and of understanding who we are in the context of understanding the world we live in. Scientific awareness does some of that, but not all of it. If we do not ensure that kids are exposed to art as much as they are to sport, we fail to offer equal opportunity, and that's just not good enough. Our responsibility also lies in pointing out what constitutes art. Every day, every human being encounters the products of artists, music, visual imagery, design, yet so few consumers, intentionally or otherwise, attribute the source of their pleasure to artists. Conquer this ignorance, demonstrate the essential service that art makes to all societies, and we will no longer have to fight so hard to persuade Treasury to recognise the role that artists play and how pitifully they are compensated for these services essential to the expression, well-being, knowledge and compassion of Australian people. Recently, there was an announcement of big new defence spending. When I hear the Minister for Defence talk about the antiquated computers and systems still being used in defence, I understand the need for spending in this area. I understand that better than I do the need for X many more tanks or subs or other hardware. But one thing I do detect is the absence of any reference to art in this context. No, I'm not going off the rails. It's part of the argument that there ought not to be just a ministry for the arts, but a desk for the arts in every ministry. Whatever sphere our society we look to, defence, housing, social services, wealth, welfare, health, sport, business, finance, science and innovation, in all of those, the arts play an important role. There is nothing surer that in the aftermath of what is done in the name of defence, artists will record what happened. Of course there are records and military archives, but after the fact, who is it that is telling the story that resonates with the nation? Isn't it through the books, poetry, photography, film, radio, music, theatre, painting, even dance? Isn't this the lasting, moving record of those things that defence is involved in, whether it be in peace, or environmental crisis or war. George Gross, George Gittos, Ben Quilty, the films, the films, Clint Eastwood's two, Iwo Jima and the Flags of Our Fathers, The Imitation Game about Alan Turing and Breaking the Code, The Monuments Men and the books. Every genre records, and perhaps more accurately, because it's with feeling than official records. Will we ever see a day when in the announcement of hundreds of billions of dollars on defence, there's just a little thought 
a little budget line spared for those who keep the true records, the artists. And if not, why not? I suggest it's because the work of artists is taken for granted, not acknowledged as providing the same essential service as a soldier, a doctor or a garbage collector. Equality of opportunity includes the opportunity of an artist to be acknowledged as an important contributor to the way our societies work, not just a self-indulgent softy at the marginal or luxury end of the way we live. This has serious implications for artists working outside the framework of those institutions which are deemed to be important for the maintenance of civil society. In the Western construct, these tend to include orchestras, ballet, opera, and traditional theatre. These institutions have at their core the representation of work which is known and loved, work whose worth is proven by the test of time, and in comparison to other measures of support, these institutions generally have more secure funding. Contemporary artists cannot be rated in the same way. We don't know whose work will survive the test of time, and trying to pick winners is about as safe as superannuation. <laughs> what we need is a robust framework for the support of contemporary art. That is for the creators and makers, writers, playwrights, choreographers, composers, as well as those who eventually perform that work to bring it before an audience. Such a framework should be equal in value to the framework which supports the preservation and reinterpretation of the canon. Of course, we demand freshness and new approaches as well as authenticity from the institutions which focus on the canon, but in the contemporary framework, even more we should demand and applaud risk, experiment, and the right to fail. As scientist Brian Greene said recently in Australia, if there's no possibility of failure, then you're not going for the big prize. In this manifesto, I declare that I will continue to demand equal opportunity for contemporary artists. At present, the lion's share of funding for the arts, that is government, corporate and philanthropic, goes to the known and loved, much of which already has a devoted paying audience. I want to see equal amounts going to the creation and presentation of new work in all genres, work which lends expression to the diverse facts of 20th, 20th century life, 21st century life, whether the subject matter is recent, historical or imagined for the future. I am not advocating cuts to any sector, not at all. I love my chamber music. For instance, I love the Australian Chamber Orchestra and everything it does. I am advocating equal opportunity for those in the creation of new work just match the resources. Philanthropists, governments at every level, corporations, communities, if you are inclined to support the arts, support all arts equally. Without that approach, we do not give living artists and their work even the first step of opportunity to create things that may well stand the test of time and may well still be pleasing and inspiring people in 500 years. We just can't tell in the now. The best we can do is enable the new work equally. So, just one more. In one respect, I want equal opportunity and more than that. In one respect, I'm greedy. I demand, if I am in agonising pain, due to an illness that would soon kill me, a framework in which I have the same opportunity as does any animal, the right to be put out of my misery. But I want more than that. I am a sentient, articulate being who is able to say, I would like to die now with dignity, with friends and loved ones around me and probably a lot of excellent champagne and beautiful music and <laughs> my favourite film, but these are personal particulars. One of the things our economy cannot afford is to allow the next generation to keep on paying for us because we keep living longer and cannot say, even in excruciating pain and the rapid descent of any quality of life, bring out the big green needle. That is also a matter of opportunity. In this manifesto, I declare that I intend to go on supporting the right to die with dignity. So sorry, Nick, you do a good job on many fronts, but as you do not support voluntary euthanasia, then I cannot support you. Not that I intend taking off any time soon. Sorry, next generation. 
I hope that my good fortune in being able to continue to work at the pace I do, these are 80 hour weeks, every week at very least, usually on a plane three or four times a week, usually shifting the place where I sleep at least every two or three days. On March the 23rd, last Wednesday, I came back to Adelaide and spent the first five days in a row anywhere since January the 1st. No, I'm not going anywhere. My ridiculous wellness continues to give me more time to revise the manifesto. I love the notion of dialectic, of trying to find the right answer for that particular time, like finding the right words for this address tonight, but demanding that position be revived and revised daily, according to each day's new circumstances. Changing one's mind is reckoned now to be political anathema, but I admire it. Being open-minded means you have to observe and listen. It demands flexibility. It does not necessarily mean only opportunism, but even then, we only need to watch a few of the Attenborough docos to see what a powerful and core driver opportunity is in the animal world. Let's not forget the basic instinct of swerving and instantly coming up with a new and better plan. None of this is easy in today's environments. Our instincts are tempered and there's mass confusion about allies and enemies. Nerida had centuries of Central and South American exploitation to scream about. Ginsburg had the establishment. He was a hippie, Jewish, gay, lefty poet. How off mainstream could you get? He knew so clearly what and who he was fighting. In 1980s London, Margaret Thatcher hoisted a huge blue flag and the left took aim. This is not today's world. As I am a positivist, I would love to end on a big sloppy positive note, but I won't. <laughs> I'm going to use my friend and colleague Michael Morley's splendid translation of Jacques Brel's song, Ça va. That's how it is. Yes, we have seen in Paris and Brussels, I do wear at this moment my uh, Officer of the Crown of uh, Belgium uh, in sympathy. Um, We've seen in Paris and Brussels, the enemy does have a flag, but not in a field where the phalanx is gathered. The flag is only revealed retrospectively in guerrilla warfare. But in many cases, there is no flag at all, no clear articulation of competing values. So assessing values becomes more complex. We can say clearly what we don't want, but it's so much harder to say what it is we do want and what we stand for but oh boy, do we need to start doing that. One day, the devil came down on earth to cast an eye over his interests. He had a good look at everything, the devil. He had a good listen to everything. And after seeing everything and after listening to everything, he returned to his home down below. And down below, a great banquet had been laid out. And at the end of the banquet, he got up, the devil, and delivered a speech. Sava! You look around and all around, there's fire ablaze throughout the land. Sava! And laughter is the only sound for men who have their war games planned. Sava! While trains in flames can run off their tracks, because some guys so full of zeal can set off bombs in their backpacks. The carnage spreads and it's ideal, cause people die without last rites or any chance to be contrite. Sava! The market falls but sales tags are fixed to honour and moral sava. And nations now not flying flags but stalking faceless company halls sava. The giants grab up all the cash from back blocks run by profiteers. And Europe does the Shylock Act. It's been rehearsing up for years. It causes famine everywhere. And people think it's quite unfair. Sava! And mankind now so much has seen that all men's eyes are turned to grey. Sava! The songs on which we were once keen 
Are now the songs of yesterday, Sava? Decent men now are just has beens. Writers all written off as mad. But all the while across our screens parade the powerful and the bad, which makes the good guys gag and choke. And all the bad guys life and joke. Sava, 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 Sava. Ah!